Hey guys, you've probably seen a lot of these already, but today I'm going to show you my Amiga 2000 rebuild project. If you like my video, please hit that subscribe button anytime. My machine's been sitting around in storage for nearly 30 years collecting dust, and I uh, thought it'd be a fun project to resurrect it and see if it actually works. So opening up the box, this machine comes with a Commodore A2630 accelerator card, as well as an A2091 SCSI hard disk controller. Amazingly, the original battery is still in there. It hasn't leaked at all from what I can see, uh, which is very surprising for something that's been sitting around for 30 years. I'm going to leave that in there for now. The machine was assembled in 1991 and is a revision 6.2. The motherboard comes with Kickstart 1.3 and the standard Agnes and Denise chips. Since I don't have access to an old CRT monitor any longer, this unit I purchased from eBay, which is a Raspberry Pi based RGB to HDMI converter and it's really straightforward. Plug it into the RGB port and attach a HDMI cable. With a 3D printer I also printed the 3D backplate and they're just attached to a socket as short HDMI cable. Now let's fire this thing up and see if it works. Amazingly we've got a picture but unfortunately it looks like one of the hard drives isn't working. I'm going to take the computer apart now and see if I can get to the bottom of the problem. The Amiga 2000 came with a Commodore A2091 SCSI controller mounted with a 50 megabyte quantum SCSI hard drive. At some stage I added an additional two 100 megabyte hard drives for a total of 250 meg. The 2091 controller also comes with an additional two megabytes of memory. After working out which was the work hard drive, I pulled it apart and noticed it had a scorch mark on the back of the Teflon sheet. Matching it up with the position on the circuit board, it turns out one of the diodes had blown. I managed to track one of these diodes down and after repairing and reassembling the drive, I reconnected everything. The workbench loads successfully. For the next part of the project, I thought I'd tackle some of the cosmetic appearances and that included repairing the case. As you can see, it has a few dents and scratches. Simply pull the case apart, give it a bit of a sand, a spray of paint, and a couple of coats of clear coat to make it look like new again. Next, I thought I'll tackle the keyboard. The spacebar was a little bit dodgy, and upon removing the bar, I noticed that a spring was missing, and the plastic guide on the left-hand side was also broken. I simply cut the existing spring into two pieces, and super glued the plastic guide back together again. The keyboard was looking pretty dirty and grimy, so I pulled off all the keys to gain access underneath, gave it a good clean, and then put the keyboard back together again. Now we have a perfectly good keyboard ready to go. Next, I pulled the mouse apart and noticed that it was quite dirty and grimy inside. Also, the left hand button was quite stiff and a bit hit and miss. So I replaced both old micro switches for new ones just for good measure gave it a good clean up inside including the ball and rollers and reassembled. One good as new Amiga tank mouse ready to roll. The original Amiga 2000 came shipped with Kickstart 1.3. To bring it up to date I also decided to upgrade it to Kickstart 3.2. Simply removed the old Kickstart 1.3 chip and installed the new 3.2 in its place. While I was at it I also upgraded the ROMs on the A2091 SCSI controller to the newer version 7 ones. As you may have noticed, the machine had a dual floppy setup as standard. This was fine back in the day when 720k floppy disks were readily available and lots of disk swapping was required to play many games. To modernise the Amiga 2000, I also purchased the GoTech floppy emulator, which replaces the floppy drive with a selectable USB interface. To give it more space, I also purchased the SCSI to SD SCSI emulator to replace those old 100 megabyte drives with an SD card for up to 32 gigabytes of storage. I wanted to keep one of the floppy drives installed in the machine just in case the need for an actual floppy drive arises in the future. I also have plans to install a CD-ROM at some stage, so I want to keep that five and a quarter inch bay available. So to avoid removing both floppy drives to accommodate the GoTech and make the SCSI to SD adapter more accessible, I decided to make a new housing to fit both devices into a single three and a half inch bay. After several failed attempts and many packs of barbecue shapes using my 3D printer, I made this two-in-one housing for the GoTech floppy emulator and SCSI to SD adapter. 
As you can see, it comfortably fits the GoTech floppy emulator board on the bottom half, with the SCSI 2SD adapter neatly and securely above it. You can find the link for the STL file on the links below if you'd like to print one or order one for your own rebuild. After giving it a lick of Commodore brown paint and a couple of screws, it mounts neatly next to one of the existing floppy drives ready to go. The power supply fan was also extremely noisy, so I decided to replace it with a new quieter fan. After removing the rivets holding the old fan in, I replaced it with a new Corsair fan. Unfortunately this was even louder than the original, so looking through my junk box I found a suitable resistor to reduce the fan speed and make it run virtually quiet. And for the final touch, since it wasn't an Amiga 2000 HD anymore, I decided to print a new label for it. It's now called the Amiga 2000 SD030 as it also has the Motorola 6830 CPU. I managed to get my hands on a couple of Wyco Red Stick joysticks as well. Uh, they weren't in too bad condition, but a little bit of alcohol to clean the contacts and a bit of WD-40 to loosen up a bit did the trick. To be able to transfer files between my PC and Amiga, I then installed from Amiga Forever a program called A-Explorer on both the PC and Amiga. I also made a serial null modem cable, but the maximum transfer rate that I was able to get between the two machines was only about 28k. It's about the same speed as a old dial-up modem. So to substantially increase the transfer rate, I got my hands on one of these flip boxes which connects to the parallel port and converts it to a Ethernet port to get a maximum speed around about 90k per second, so about three times quicker than the serial. To get the TCP IP working on the Amiga side, you need to install a program called Miami DX, and this allows the Amiga to connect via that Ethernet port and flip box to your broadband router, and therefore the same network as your PC, so you can easily just copy and paste your files across. I then proceeded to install some of my favourite programs, including Directory Opus, Deluxe Paint, Scala Multimedia, Octomed Studio, and of course some of my favourite games including Another World, and also Sysinfo which shows the performance of this computer, which you can see that it, it runs just under the speed of a full-blown Amiga 3000. And the speed of the SCSI controller is an impressive 6 megabits per second. Thanks very much guys, I hope you've enjoyed my Amiga 2000 restoration project. If you need any information on any of the products that I've used today, please look at the description section below for more details. And be sure to come back and visit my channel sometime, I'll be putting up some new videos of me playing some of my favourite games. If you like my presentation today, please hit that like and subscribe buttons below.